All right, guys, I am back. It's Jeremy from Jeremy.net. So the uh, the original live stream just didn't uh, – I couldn't get the audio working to get my buddy Vince on there with us. So I ended that stream, started a new one. Later on, we're going to have to sit down uh, separately and figure out why I couldn't get the audio working because he could see me. I could see him, but we couldn't get the uh, the settings going where I could hear him, which, you know, kind of the the point of having an online conversation with with people. So, thanks for bearing with me, those of you who uh, who sat through the the beginning uh, crash and burn. And uh, well, now I guess it's just back to uh, to business as usual. So for everyone who who is stuck in here for who. We're just joining in for this one. Thanks for coming by. And now I'm trying to get the chat going again. And what's weird is that it's not showing me what was on the chat before. So that's odd. Hmm. Yeah, today is just not a great day for, for me with the live streaming. This is what happens when I try to change stuff up. All right. Here we go. All right. This looks like this should be... Sierra uh... <laughs> Studios popped in and said, you're competing with Jim Lee for views right now. He's on Twitch. Well, you know what? I'm glad... <laughs> that I got you guys hanging out here that, that have showed up. All right. Um, so apologies for all of that, uh, that, that rough start. Guys, thanks for bearing with me. I see uh, UL is in here. Um, is book two of Boring Star going to hit Amazon soon? It's the first question. Um, well, it's not going to hit Amazon soon only because book two, which is going to be the second half, that's going to be the end of the story, um, I have to finish issue seven and issues eight. So right now, the pages I have here in front of me are pages seven and eight of issue seven. So I got to finish issue seven, then issue eight. I expect to have it on Amazon book two, the, the second half of the story, sometime in 2019. Because I want to get this issue done and out the door, obviously, before the end of the year, and then just crank on finishing up issue eight. Um, let's see. Oh, this is referenced into the, uh, the the earlier questions we had. Um, Epic Trilogy said Franklin Booth. Anyone know who is more detailed with a line? That's true. Franklin Booth is so detailed and beautiful, it kind of makes my head hurt. I see a lot of Franklin Booth in, in Frank Cho's ballpoint pen drawings. Um, I would say Franklin Booth and um, Bernie Wrightson, another great creator who does incredibly detailed work. I would put those guys up in the uh, the Franklin Booth category. Let's see, Amaris Joseph has popped into the chat. Thanks for uh, for stopping by. And um, Yule Adams mentioned for the whole problems we're having with Vince that that Vince was muted. Um, what's crazy is I tried muting and unmuting Vince's mic. I, there's a thing on the Google Hangouts where you can switch controls to the other person or let, give them access to the, the control board. I switched that over to, to him and Vince tried muting and unmuting his mic. That wasn't working. So he and I are just going to get on separately after this stream and just see if we can work out the audio kinks there so that hopefully the next time that we try to have a, a group hangout, it'll go smoother. We can all just sort of, you know, enjoy, have a pleasant conversation, talking art and comics. And um, yeah, Yule Adams also said uh, a new stream can wipe the, the old cache of a, of a chat. So that is all good to know because these are all things like when um, – when Greg Giordano has had me on, or um, or Peter Palmiotti, when they've had me uh, guess on their stream, and I think I sat in with the uh, the art casters one time a long time ago um, with uh, Scott Circlin and um, oh oh I feel like such a dick because I can see his name right in front of me and I can't say I can't think of his name the the, the other host. Oh God, and I've known him for years. Other host of Big Illustration Party Time. Why am I? I'm just having a brain fart. I know your name and I'm sorry it's not coming to me. It's because I'm having technical difficulties. My, I'm having a brain fart. But um, but when they had me on on their show, 
that everything went smoothly because I just plugged in and um, and everything worked fine. Joshua Kimball. Thank you. Sorry. It just brain fart. See, I really didn't know your name. And I didn't go and look that up. I wasn't cheating. I just it just took a while to surface. But um, when they had me on on their stream a long time ago, every time I've been on other people's streams, it's real simple. They send me a link, I click on it, I turn on my camera, I talk. Everything else is, has worked fine. When, on my end, me trying it for the first time, it was a disaster. And the thing I've seen from most other creators, whenever they get on, whenever they're hosting for the first time, it's a disaster. Um, so, but it looks like we're on. So these are pages that I've been working on. And these are probably some of the most detailed pages I've done in my life. And I generally don't think of myself as a particularly detailed artist. The reason for putting so much detail into these pages is not, it's not because I feel like the detail itself makes a better page. Detail unto itself does not make work better. What makes work better in my opinion is specificity, which is instead of just making a line kind of indicating what you want them to be to actually describe it clearly and say this form is turning around that form this muscle this plane part of the muscles on the the top side um this is where it starts turning over and away into the shadow here's the rounding of a, a breast or the um the curve of a thigh being able to describe the tops bottoms and sides of a form using texture to describe a rough texture versus a smoothness of skin versus the scattering of leaves being specific in how you describe things, in my opinion, is what makes good artwork, not the amount of detail used for that specificity. And so I was working on this page, and when I finished it, I looked at it, and I kind of said to myself, do I really need all this detail? I mean, I'm very, very proud of this page. I'm happy with this page. I really do feel like this is one of the best pages I've drawn to date. But the question is, can I convey the same elements of story that I'm trying to convey without this level of detail. Like I would probably say in the panels below, these two lower panels are probably closer to the amount of detail that I want to have in any particular panel. Like, you know, I definitely describe the trees, the, the characters, the, the ground plane, the, the rocks in the environment. You know, those are the things that I try to catch in it, capture and describe in any given page. And it could just be the fact that because this is an establishing shot and it's full of creatures, that it just lend itself to that. And I'm being overly concerned about something that's just the nature of doing narrative storytelling, sequential storytelling in comics. Is just in some panels, you have to put a lot of detail to kind of show where everything is and give a sense of mood and feeling. And it's not necessarily that I'm just putting detail in for detail's sake. Then even with this page, where I'm still not quite done yet, and I realized I put this up on the wall like I was finished, and I forgot that I haven't finished drawing in the uh, the bark on the tree. So I think instead of starting this other page that I had sitting off to the side, I'm going to finish this thing up, and then we'll see once I'm done with this how much time there is to, to get into starting this page. So I'm going to put that to the side there. Let's see here. Checking the chats. And uh, first off, the, the question from UL asking, what kind of inspiration do you pull from for your style and story? And you can see the depth of the 3D. And thank you. That's definitely, I wanted to create a sense of environment. That's um, creating a sense of environment is something that I've been trying to work at because, in general, on a comic page, in the past, I have drawn just sort of like the indication of a background, just a simple tree. And it's almost like it was a flat backdrop around characters that felt three-dimensional, but they didn't feel like they were in an environment. And in my mind, that's that's a flaw in my storytelling. So I want, not so for the environments to be detailed, but I do want the characters to feel like they can move back and forth in space. So when you mentioned the, the three three-dimensional quality of it, I wanted to create a sense of you know foreground, mid-ground, background, and that characters could move in between those spaces. It's something that I haven't done in the past in my work, and I'm pushing myself to do more than I've done in the past. But it's a conversation that I've been having with a lot of my creative friends, um, 
I mentioned it when I was talking to uh, my figure drawing instructor I studied with, Carl Ganas, <clears throat> about the fact that, like, should I be focusing so much on improving my drawing when I could also be focusing, putting more of my energy on improving my storytelling? Because, you know, I don't think that I'm ever going to be a Jim Lee, a, um, an Adam Hughes, or a Brian Stelfreeze. Those are kind of the, the creators that I, I really look at for inspiration. But to go specifically to the question you had about who am I drawing for in terms of my style, um, I would say the artists that I'm probably most recently influenced by are guys like um, Paul Pope and um, the guy who did Punk Rock Jesus, um, Sean, Sean Murphy. Sean Murphy, Paul Pope, um, you know, guys that have kind of a a nice luscious ink line that's it feels a lot more effortless than it is. Like I'm sure he's very you know specific of he has enough control over the craft that the surface line work can look very loose because the structure underneath is very solid. Now those are guys I'm influenced by, but I went through a period over the past years where I kind of stopped looking at the artists I'm influenced by and said, let me just focus on improving my draftsmanship. Um, hang on, I'm going to move this page away so I can start inking here. All right, so like I was saying, improving my draftsmanship. Um, there's a ton of comic artists that have influenced me over the years. Um, everyone from John Byrne and Walt Simonson to Frank Miller to, you know, like I mentioned, Adam Hughes and uh, Brian Stelfreeze. There's a wide variety of creators whose work influenced me in terms of like just their mastery of craft and of storytelling. And I try to look at what they're doing and not necessarily imitate them, but say, what are they doing well? And how can I incorporate that craft, that skill into my skill set, even though my work's going to look differently. But yeah, at a certain point I had to say, I just need to learn how to draw better. Then it really turned to um, Andrew Loomis, Bridgman. Um, and I would honestly say that Carl Ganas has been a, probably the biggest influence in terms of my draftsmanship over the past few years, because, you know, he, he studying with him taught me to love figure drawing and to love studying the human form such that I know that I still have a lot to learn, but I don't feel like that's daunting. Like if for some reason I wasn't able to do comics anymore and all I could do is just go to figure drawing class and study, you know, drawing from the model, I could be happy doing that for the rest of my life because there's always going to be, th nah, I'd still want to tell stories. That's bullshit. Uh, <laughs> I'm BSing you and I realize I can't lie. I'd still want to tell stories. But I get a lot of pleasure out of studying the human form in a figure drawing setting much more than I used to. Like a lot of people get frustrated by it, find it challenging, find it difficult, don't enjoy it. I love it. Um, let me pop back to the chat real quick. Um, Amaris Joseph mentioned, uh, has anyone seen the Holly Brown art scrub video? It's a very harsh video, but it's informative, but informative about not falling into the same trap as her. I haven't seen that video. I will go and watch it later on. I will, as a matter of fact, I'm going to write that down because I will probably forget in the course of talking with you guys. But that's one of the things I love about this is that you guys always have good recommendations because it's not like I see everything on the internet and see what other artists are doing. And like I said, I am as much a student as any of the rest of you. I'm always trying to learn and improve my craft. So let me write that down. Holly Brown Arts. Let's see. Um, and uh, Ion Rocks, you know, greatest cheerleader any creator could, comic creator could could uh, could have said, you know, the page looks awesome, and don't do that in terms of comparing myself to other people. You have to stand in your own greatness, which I appreciate. That's the that you were a big catalyst for a lot of this conversation about how hard I'm pushing myself, and at what point is it diminishing returns? Like, am I pushing myself just for the sake of it when I could just get on with it and tell the story? And I think that's. I'm not sick of working on Morningstar. I'm glad I'm working on it, but I do feel like I've been taking way too long with it and I need to wrap the story up. 
And that's one of the things that I'm realizing is I'm getting to the point where I need to just get down to business. So let's see. Now, you know, Christian Vincent just said that I've been a huge influence on his style along with uh, Sean Murphy. And I have to tell you, that's probably the most humbling thing that I could hear that my work would influence and inspire somebody else. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, I know that for me, like, when I get to talk to artists whose work I admire, it just makes me want to keep pushing and growing and trying to, to do more. So I hope that's the, the big thing that you're taking. I mean, it's weird because it's almost like I'm trying to, I'm telling you, I'm encouraging you to do the thing that I'm questioning whether I do too much, which is that I always feel like I want to grow and work on my craft and, and improve. And I definitely want to inspire you to do that. Um, at the same time, I realize, oh, at a certain point, I need to just get down to telling the story. But but thank you. That that means a lot to me. You know, I know that I've told this story once a very long time ago, but um I I would say that when I was in my mid twenties to early thirties, my big influences were well, even when I was in high school, I was already a huge fan of Bilson Kevich. And then when I was in college, I think that was when uh, Kabuki started coming out by David Mack. And so you could see a direct line from Bill Sienkiewicz's influence to David Mack's influence to then um, Ashley Wood's work. Now, I remember when Ashley Wood was drawing covers for Todd McFarlane's uh, Spawn graphic novels. And uh, oh, I see American Swordfish popped in. Man, good to see you. Thanks for, for coming by. I had a little bit of a calamity with getting uh, everything online earlier, but I'm glad you made it. And I'm glad uh, the schedule worked out. Uh, so Ashley Wood. I was very conflicted when I first started seeing Ashley Wood's sequential comics work. Not conflicted because I, I didn't like it. I loved it. The problem is, I had a picture in my mind of what my work would look like. Hang on, I'm not going to talk for a second because I'm pouring ink and I actually need to look at it and focus. Because otherwise, if I am pouring this and I don't pay attention, I'm going to spill it all over the place and I really don't want to do that. I don't want to mess up the camera position, but you know what? Let me raise it up so you can, I don't know if you'll be able to see or not, but I've got like my iPad to the side and just to the side of that, now nah, you're not gonna be able to see it. But just to the side of my iPad is, um, my little well of ink that's silly puttied to the table. All right. There we go. I'm gonna have to get some soft lights for this because I feel like the, the reflection that it's got over the little signs there is a little much. Um, I will come back and check check up the chat in a sec. Let me wrap up the story I was telling about Ashley Wood. Um, I should probably move this to the other side so I actually don't have to worry about, so I can kind of get my arms in here the way I like to when I'm inking. Um, I had a picture in my mind of what I imagined my artwork would look like when I could draw well enough to draw exactly what was in my mind. And I had seen Ashley Wood's painted covers, but when he started working on, um, I think it was first Brian Bendis and then uh, David, Ma uh, not David Mack, um, Steve Niles on the Spawn book, Hell Spawn, which is sort of a grittier, darker, more horror oriented version of Spawn. When I saw Ashley Wood's interior pages, I was kind of like, damn. Because what Ashley Wood was doing was exactly what I imagined my artwork would grow into when I could draw as well as I wanted to. 
And mind you, I'm very sensitive. I've always been sensitive to the idea of aping another artist's style. It's generally considered a no-no in comics. You don't want to copy what other artists are doing. Being inspired by them, yes, but to just actively just copy their style, no. Um, so with Ashley Wood, I was like, well, there's already an Ashley Wood and he's doing what I want to do. And even if I had that vision on my own, I didn't know, like, I, it's almost like my ID, my identity, my artistic identity was sort of preempted. Like someone else was already doing the artistic identity that I wanted to have. And I didn't really feel like I had a right to claim that artistic identity because I couldn't do that work yet and he could. So he got there first because he did the work and you know his work showed it. Um, and so I went through a long period where I was just not sure what I was doing stylistically. And that led me to probably the most important decision that I made because that's what got me back into figure drawing, which was there was one day and I was working on my first book, Eye of the Gods. And um, and guys, I will get back to the, the comments in the chat, <laughs> I promise. Um, I was working on my first graphic novel, Eye of the Gods. And at some point, I went and looked at a... I went and I, I went to grab a copy of the first volume of Ashley Wood's Pop Bot because I wanted to look how he treated a certain background scene because I was doing something similar. And I walked halfway across the room, I got to my bookshelf, and I stopped. I said, well, why am I looking at that? I'm not Ashley Wood. Ashley Wood is Ashley Wood. And this isn't me trying to say screw Ashley Wood. I still love his work. I still think his work is beautiful and amazing. But I realized that he's him. And I need, if I'm going to be a comp creator, I need to figure out my own solutions to these problems, my visual problems, my storytelling problems. That's where my style is going to come from. So I thought what I should look at is people that are teaching the fundamentals. And that's what got me, one, back into figure drawing class, and two, looking at um, artists like John Ham, not John Ham, uh, Jack Ham. John Ham's a dude from Mad Men. Um, I just saw a Baby Driver the other night. So I guess I have a little ham on my mind. But, uh, but I realized like looking at Andrew Loomis, looking at Bridgman, looking at John Hamm, looking at all these people who are instructors of the craft of drawing. And it has nothing to do with style. They're not trying to teach style. They're trying to teach you the fundamentals. And I realized that it drove me on the course of just trying to learn how to draw better. So when I think about style, I would love to do really brushy, loose, expressive work. And I do feel like my work is already pretty loose and expressive. If you compare it to somebody like a, a Jim Lee or say Philip Tan, like an artist who is very tight, very controlled, very detailed, but every line is expressing something. I feel like my work is much more just sort of splashing lines on and suggesting things. And that's part of the reason why we get back to me so wrapped up in putting too much detail or spending more time because what I'm trying to put my energy towards is specificity, really specifically describing and saying what I'm trying to say instead of just putting a mark down that suggests things. And even suggesting things in artwork, that's not a bad thing. There's plenty of artists who do very, like I'm thinking of sort of Peter Kupperberg, who he does sort of like a painterly thing. He's did a lot of stuff that appeared in heavy metal. Um, but his stuff almost looks like, uh, like spray can, spray paint artwork. I'm not sure if he uses an airbrush to do it but his stuff is much more suggestive and graphic than it is him doing very tight, detailed control work. And so I, I believe that there is a place for that too. And at some point I would like to get back to doing really painted looser work. Like, and that's saying something cause I already feel like my work is pretty loose, but what holds me back and what has led me to this path of tightening down even more and more on what I'm drawing and spending what I would start to say is too much time on every page is me trying to get away from what I felt like my feelings were, which was being unspecific, being too general and too broad and suggesting things and trying to achieve specificity. 
And now that I'm at this point where I've been drawing so much, that I feel like I'm slowing the process down. I'm trying to figure out how to be more specific with fewer lines. So even this, I feel like some of the lines on this side are more suggest more specific in terms of wrapping around. And then I feel like just these thicker lines in here got a little bit muddy. And that's a danger I have sometimes when I'm drawing while I'm talking is I just start rambling. And I'm not paying attention as much to what I'm doing. But back to the chats. Um, let's see. So American Swordfish again, being been popped into the chat. I'm going back up. And Yusel said that I think you draw very original. I appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, Iron Rock said that you inspire me. I keep telling you your work ethic is amazing. Thank you again. I, I appreciate that, guys. It's, uh, you know, I, I did a video sometime earlier in the year, or it might have been the beginning of last year, where I said, um, loving, it was something to the effect of learning to love the work, the hard work itself. Because there's no guarantees that I'm going to be a successful comic artist. And by successful, I mean making my living full time and making a, a decent living um, doing my own artwork and my own writing and drawing and self-publishing. But the only reward that you can hope to, that you can get is the satisfaction you get from a well-drawn page. So if you're not proud of that page you drew, then you're missing out on the big pleasure of making comics because that's the only thing that's guaranteed to you is that you're going to make a piece of artwork and because there may or may not be any financial returns you damn sure better enjoy the process of creating and you better enjoy that you made that so i find not just the act of making the page not just having a finished page that looks good i don't just find that satisfying but i find the process of that that battle that we all have when we're trying to make our drawings come out better that I'm not as frustrated by that as I was when I was younger. I find that battle to be, I've used this metaphor many times in the, uh, the live stream, like playing a video game. And when you're playing a level and that level's kicking your ass and you just go at it again and again and again until hopefully, you know, you're able to work it out and the whole thing comes together. That's a lot of what I try to treat this process as is, it's, it's a game and I try to have fun with it and say, all right, well, I tried to beat the level this way, that didn't work, let me try to beat the level that way. Sometimes I'll find something new and innovative and a, you know, a new way to solve a visual problem or a new way to render form that I hadn't tried before or that someone suggests to me online or I see in a, a video or a tutorial and I give it a try. Maybe it works and I add it to my toolbox, maybe it doesn't, um, but yeah, I gotta, try and enjoy that process because that may be the only reward that I get. But also, you know what? The reward really is being able to spend time with you guys because like a lot of artists, you know, I'm not shy, but I am somebody who likes to spend a lot of time by myself because, you know, writing and drawing is a solitary process. And in a way, hanging out with you guys is like me having that solitary focus that you have for an art yet having a sense of community at the same time it's like letting you guys all into the uh, the noise and the chaos in my head because you guys understand the same struggles the same battles that i'm fighting so um let's see here american swordfish says jeremy inspires me in what not to do <laughs> i appreciate that I i'm making mistakes so you don't have to um UL Adams said, creating a universe takes time, even if parallel to one people can have connection to, so um, connections to more so if doing it right. And uh, Christian Benson said, I just discovered Kabuki two days ago. The artwork is excellent. Um, the arc is excellent. And I will say that the writing gets better and better with each volume. And the finish, the, the climax of the whole series is a, a volume called The Alchemy. And that book, the, the series starts off, it's a spy, a violent spy action drama with some socio-political implications. But as the series goes on, it gets deeper and deeper and more personal. And by the end, the book really is about self-transformation, which I find to be amazing. And it's literally 
written to speak directly to artists and creatives. So I really think that by the time you get to the end of that, that series is worth reading all the way to the finish. I think that it gets better and better as it goes along. And let's see, American Swordfish said creating a universe and its rules are so hard. And yes, I definitely agree with that. Um, I almost don't even, when it comes to world building, I don't know if I would say that I I do a I world build to the point of like a, a Tolkien, like a very rich detailed world. It's a lot more like I try to create just enough to make the world feel authentic and lived in, but it's kind of like a movie set where if you turn to the left or the right, you don't see anything there, you just see cardboard. Um, and so I think if you don't see that in my work, then that means that I'm doing a good job of creating the illusion of a very deep, well thought out world. Like I just sort of figure out what do I need to tell the story? And that's funny because I can tell you that the same struggle I'm having with art, with visuals in terms of putting too much detail in or trying to be too specific, I'm going through sort of a parallel journey with writing, but I feel like I still am so early on in that phase as a writer in terms of exploring how to describe a world and create an authentic sense of character, time, place, events that and people that you will care about, that I've just got a lot to to go to, to, to a lot of growing to go get to before I get to the point where I'm describing things so much that I'm like, hey, I need to back off. There's too much there. So let's see here. And uh, you all, Adam said, I still, uh, I still ink with printer's ink. Um, it's funny. Right now, I've been inking with uh, a bottle of Delator Japanese ink. And I think I may have shown this to you guys before. Um, my buddy Carl Altstetter gave me this ink. Let's see here. Yeah, there it is. So... This thing is almost empty, and when it's done, I'm probably going to go back to my Speedball um, India ink that I've been using. By the way, for those who have watched in the past, do you think that the visual quality of just the, the quality of how well you can see my, my uh, drawing table and the crispness of the images, do you think that it is about equal in this video as it has been in previous videos? Because... When I look at, um, I'm looking over at my computer now to kind of just watch the stream as it's playing. When I'm streaming from my, my phone, <clears throat> it looks clearer and crisper to me. So this looks a little bit blurrier and a little bit grainier on my end. And I figure if it looks like that on my end, it pro you're probably seeing that too. So in the future, I may only use the, the webcam if I'm trying to have other people sitting in on the actual chat and the rest of the time I may stick with just using my phone if it's just me doing a solo show. So let me know if the quality is, if there's a, if you see the drop in quality that I'm imagining in terms of just the, the crispness of the, the image that you can see. Um, let's see here. I see other people talking here. Let's see, Holly Brown, Trace Art, let's see. And David Mac also makes, tra I see American Surfers saying David uh, Mac also traces art. I don't like him. Um, I haven't seen David Mac really tracing stuff, but um, I mean, I haven't really sat and watched him draw that much. I really do actually like David Mac's artwork. And his, I think that first off, I think if he is tracing stuff, he might be using his own photo reference. Like I've got a book on Norman Rockwell and a lot of people feel like Norman Rockwell's work is just too photorealistic, but a lot of his Norman Rockwell's life and magic comes from the fact that he does his con his compositional sketches first. He works out what he wants the image to look like, where he wants the figures, and then he shoots has his own photo reference shot afterwards, and then he will project his photo reference onto the artboard. So if you're actually art directing the photography as opposed to just grabbing a picture online and tracing it. I don't feel like that's a cheat. I mean, I feel the only thing that's really cheating is passing another artist's work off as your own. But um, if you're specifically taking your own photo reference and then you're projecting that onto an illustration board or you're just printing your photo ref your own photo reference you shot 
onto whatever you're going to draw over, I don't think that's a cheat. I don't think working off of photography in that sense is really a cheat. But you know what? That's up for that's a choice for you to make. I can't say that you shouldn't have that opinion. They're opinions. We're all allowed to have them. I'm just saying for me personally, that, that doesn't bother me. Um, let's see here. I'm doing bad at staying on staying up on the chat <laughs> this time. I'm I'm way back up. Uh, let's see. Manuel Adams also said it might be a lot like martial arts foundation, like martial arts foundations can be similar, but everyone uses a different style. Yeah, I definitely think that that's true. That's kind of like the idea of learning the rules and the fundamentals so that you can break them because everyone is going to break them in different ways and, and uh, express them in different ways. But learning those essential fundamentals is important. And those things I still feel like I'm mastering. In fact, like when I take, I just have like three figure drawing classes that I take over and over again. And I find that each time I take those classes, I get, I find something new in each of the lectures that I didn't get before, even though I've been sitting through some of these same lectures for like a decade now. So there's something cyclical about learning where it's not like you're just going in a circle and learning the same thing. It's almost like it's a concentric circle that rises like a spring or a coil. As you go around, each time you go a little bit higher and you learn at a higher level and a higher level and a higher level. And hopefully that raises your craft. Um, <laughs> Christian Vinson called me out on the, uh, the, the John Hamm. And yeah, I would love to see John Hamm as Batman. Like he would make a great, um, the problem with, you know, he would make a great, like, Dark Knight Returns Batman, but even that, I feel like he's not as old as I'd want him to be. Like, I feel like I'd want somebody in their 50s, like, because in the comic, in Dark Knight Returns, Batman really did feel old and grizzled. And John Hamm, even to me, still feels a little bit younger than that version of Batman. But uh, let's see. Unique Flowbot mentioned he just watched uh, Jim Lee draw Spider-Man and Thor on Twitch. I may have to hop over there just to see what his... Because that's just going to put me to shame, seeing how quickly he can draw the stuff. Because, I mean, he can draw very, very well and very, very fast. And there's a saying in comics, first you get good, then you get fast, then you get good and fast. And I feel like I'm still working on part one. So there's so many layers on there that sometimes looking at somebody, you know, I don't want it to sound like I'm, obviously, I'm one of the biggest people who is into learning and learning from other artists. But there is a point at which I realize by spending so much time focusing on what other people are doing, I realize that like you can fall into that comparisonitis where you're looking at what other people can do and, and it can be a little depressing when I'm like, oh wait, I'm never gonna be able to do that. Why am I even trying? So for me, I don't feel like I'm I want to learn what other creators are doing, but I don't want to learn because I want to do what Jim Lee does. I want to be able to do what I do at the same level of skill that he does what he does, what he's doing. So I probably will go over and look at that video later on. And I'll tell you, when I finish Morningstar, I'm probably going to try to just do my next book as quickly as possible just to see what it feels like to draw a comic extremely fast. Um, I've had issues of Morningstar that I intentionally drew fast just to see like, well, would I be fast enough to draw a monthly comic? And while I was able to finish the books quicker, not at the speed of a monthly comic book artist, I realized I wasn't happy with the quality of that. So there's that two, that, that double-edged sword of speed and quality that I still feel like I, I battle a lot of trying to work faster but still have it look as good as something that I'm going to be really, really proud of. Um, American Swordfish, <laughs> yes. Um, oh, by the way, yeah, I said the shadows are, are, are on point. That demon lady already scares me, <laughs> scares me, and I don't know the character. Yeah, um, this character is... Is Baal. She's sort of the queen of the demons. And thank you. I'm glad you, you like the shadows. I really wanted intentionally to try and work out something where you could still tell where she... I wanted her to blend in with the trees and the shadow of the, the trees being underneath it, but that still you could identify the figure and her hair. So that was sort of a challenge for me. Um, and I try to challenge myself on every page. That might be part of the reason why things have taken so long, because I'm really trying to, to challenge it. 
And um, yeah, also saying that John Hamm is perfect for Batman, so hopefully he will play Batman at some point. And uh, and Jim Lee draws better on his live streams. Yep, maybe he maybe that's one of those things. He's doing a, a crowd pleaser for the, the fans. And Christian, thank you for answering my question about the uh, the visuals on the phone. Um, Christian saying that the stream does look crisper and looking clearer when I'm doing it streaming from my phone. So I think the next time that I do a group chat, it'll probably be this quality because it's I can't do a I can broadcast from Google Hangouts from my phone. And I can have a conference call with other artists on my phone, but I can't do an on-air broadcast hangout from my phone, at least not yet. I haven't found a way to do it yet. So we'll have to, to see what I can do to figure that out in the, the beginning. And you also, Adam said that uh, it looks fine on his TV. Um, so yeah, it's, it's good that it's, you know what? Maybe I need to buy, see if I can get like a 4K webcam. That's something I should look at, but I don't know if it's necessarily the quality of the camera itself or whether it's the bandwidth, because even when I am drawing with my phone on, I have to turn off my uh, Wi-Fi and actually have to use my cellular plan, which fortunately I have an unlimited plan, but I have to switch to, to cellular to stream because if I stream from the Wi-Fi in the house, I'm pretty far from the antenna my studio is. So the quality really breaks up. So I don't know how much of this the, the visual quality is the camera and how much is my uh, my Wi-Fi connection. So that's something I have to look at in the future. Let's see. Um, another Daniel Williams asks, do I have any art books for about clothing and folds? Let me see. Uh, my cats are pissed because one of them is sleeping right by the uh, the bookcase with my art books. And she's like, don't you dare move me <laughs> to get you to your books. Let's see. Okay. Well, I would say in terms of drawing clothing, I burn Hogarth. I don't look at as much anymore because he. I think he's the the art book that most creators are introduced to when they, they first get into art and comics. But I find the problem with Hogarth is that all of the muscles are flexed. So he's got like the muscles that should be pulling a form. Those are flexing and he's got the ones on the other side flexing. So it makes the forms look a little bit more distorted. And I know he's doing that so that you can see all the muscles, but it gives sort of a, a distorted sense of what the human form really looks like when everything is flexed. Um, but he has a book on the draped figure, and that one is pretty good. Um, but in terms of the main thing I look at when I'm looking at costumes and drapery, part of it is that um, the instructor I studied with, Carl Ganas, he teaches a class specifically on costume and drapery. And I think most of what I've learned, I've got taken from that class. But this draw book by... Uh, Jack Ham is um, it, it's drawing the head and the figure. This book is a great overall figure drawing book. Um, it, this is one of those books that gets into the fundamentals. Um, almost half the book is just on the head and the features. The other half of the book is on drawing the human figure, proportion, anatomy, um, structure. But towards the end of the book, it has a, a section that's not that long, but it gets into clothing. And I feel like this book, like it has a section on drawing men's shoes, women's shoes. Um, let's see here. Then it gets into some basics on folds. It gets into different types of drapery and how it bends, um, female clothing. And the ideas of this book is that it's not a reference book for how to draw every type of clothing. What it does is it looks at the fundamentals of the human body's structure that it try that it communicates earlier on, and then it tries to apply those same concepts to the structure of fabric. Like this particular diagram, I think is excellent in terms of describing what I'm talking about, because it's showing a very simple mannequin form of cylinders and spheres. And that's saying, this is how 
folds will wrap around different parts of the body and that you can use folds to describe volume the same way you would use these basic cylinders to describe volume. So this book isn't all about drawing clothing, but this book has so much in it that I would say this is kind of a must have book because it gives you, this book is one of those that I would say almost, I would put it on the degree with um, Andrew Loomis's figure drawing for all it's worth in terms of it giving you a, a well-rounded primer on drawing the figure in all of its aspects. So this is a pretty good one. Um, I'll tell you, I think there's probably stuff on clothing in uh, figure drawing for all it's worth, but that's one of those books where I get so caught up in the early parts, I haven't even gone through every single page yet. Um, there's lots of pages in the back half that I still haven't studied. Like I've gotten, I've, I've gotten about halfway through in terms of actually doing studies from the stuff on lighting and, um, in composition, and I've drawn all redrawn and done studies from the early parts. In fact, that might be something I'll do. I don't know if I'll do it next week or the week after, but sometime in the future, I think maybe I'll grab some Loomis, pick some pages. And if you guys have any suggestions for things you want to see me study from figure drawing for all it's worth, jot, you know, put them in the chat, and maybe I'll just pick a page on that topic and show you how I study Loomis. And you know, we can just talk about it while I'm working on it. All right, that book's back in the bookshelf. Um, let's see. And you all, Adams also mentioned, uh, yeah, going back to basics can unlock new doors. And that's, yeah, that was kind of the, the cyclical thing that I was talking about. Um, like when people talk about how they say, I couldn't even draw a straight line, like people that are not artists, and I look at them, I'm all, most artists can't draw a straight line. That's why we have rulers. Um, something like drawing a circle, a perfectly round sphere, I look at that almost like meditation. Like in that sense of it's never going to be perfect, drawing a, a sphere that's as round as possible and close to a, a perfect circle is sort of like an exercise in how in control and trying to achieve a, a perfect state of concentration because there's always going to be a place where it's a little bit off and you're never going to draw the perfect sphere or the perfect cylinder. But it's that, again, perfect is the enemy of finished. But the pursuit of perfection is what raises our skills. And it's just a matter of learning which I, this is my biggest struggle right now. It's not about learning. It's about learning not to take raising my skills too far. Um, not in that sense that I don't want to raise my skills, but the fact that I do feel like I'm getting into that territory of hindering producing work because I'm pursuing raising my skill set to this degree. And that makes it sound like I'm saying I'm not going to keep trying to get better. I'm done improving. And that's not true at all. I want to find a way to continue to improve, but produce more work while doing it. And you know, it's funny. You shouldn't, you don't, you wouldn't think that it would slow me down. You would think that just by producing more work, I would naturally get better. But I see that when I don't spend time doing figure drawing studies or studying from art books, or if I miss figure drawing class um, a couple weeks in a row, you would think that as long as I'm drawing comics, my work would continue to improve. And I've seen over the years that there is improvement, but it's very gradual. Whereas when I am actively studying and working on the craft and then taking the things I study and then trying to apply them to my comics and using the comic page as a place to practice anatomy, storytelling, perspective, um, environment, structure, volume, lighting. When I'm using my comics as a place to study those things and practice them, the work improves and my skill does improve faster. But it it takes me longer because I have to think about it more and I have to be more conscious of it. So that's the struggle is how to do both of those things without slowing down. Let's see here. And uh, Christian says, when you go to 
the figure drawing classes, what do you draw with? I'm hella curious. I want to get back into it. It's been a few years. Um, if you look at any of my fixing bad figure drawing videos or streams in the uh, in the archive on my page, those will show you what I'm doing when I'm working on when I'm working in figure drawing class. And I tend to draw with charcoal pencils. Let me see. Do I have any here? I've got my draw, figure drawing pencils over in a, another place. But charcoal pencils, they're just like sticks of charcoal, but they're thinner and they're in, you know, they've got wood around them like a, a graphite pencil. But it's just sticks of charcoal. And I tend to draw with something along the lines of 2B to 4B. I used to draw with 6B, which is very, very soft, very, very dark. And the reason I did that is because I am heavy handed. I press pretty hard on the page when I'm drawing. And I tend to make really dark marks, and I don't leave enough room to sort of slowly darken the page. And you would think that if I have that problem, then I would do the opposite. I would draw with something that doesn't make dark marks. But what I try to do is force myself to deal with and confront whatever problems I have. So if my problem is pressing really, really hard, then I make something that if I make even the slightest amount of pressure, it makes a really dark mark because gradually it forced me to really lighten my touch. And now I have a much lighter touch when I draw with ink, when I draw on pencil, when I draw on charcoal. Um, I haven't been painting in a long time, but I plan to get back into painting in acrylic. And I found that with all of my tools now, by drawing with a really dark medium, it forced me to learn how to have a, a lighter hand. So yeah, when I do my figure drawing work, charcoal pencils, usually Generals is the, the brand I've, I've stuck with over the past few years. And anything from a 2B to a 4B. So let's see. And uh, you all mentioned uh, sketching the comic fast and going back and add detail and going back, add detail and uh, reworking it deeper. That's actually exactly the process I want to use for probably the last issue of Morningstar and for my next series is trying to do the, – the challenge for me is that the whole reason why I published Morningstar in single issues is because it took me over five years to finish my first book, Eye of the Gods. And I don't want to just disappear and not draw any comics and have everyone see my work for a number of years. But what works best for me is to thumbnail an entire 140 page graphic novel, then letter my thumbnails for the whole book, then read it, edit it, figure out what I do need to move around, and then do layouts for the entire book and then ink the entire book. But doing it in that way means that nobody sees everything I'm, I'm doing for years at a time. So I figured at least doing one issue at a time I could, I can kind of show you at least, you know, I haven't disappeared and fallen off the face of the earth. By the way, this page, as far as I'm concerned, is done. So I'm going to go and take it off of the drawing board and put it on my little uh, work in progress wall. You know what? I don't think I have shown you guys this in a stream before. <sighs> if you get motion sick, Hang on for a second, because I'm going to move the camera around. So I'm going to let me detach my camera here. So this, so here is my drawing board where I'm working. I'm sorry, I'm yelling in your ear because the camera's real close to my face right now. So over here is my work in progress wall. And let me back up a little bit. What I do is as I finish, there's two rows of, uh, of binder clips. So there's, I just go across and I just put pages up as I finish along the wall. And there's enough pages, enough hooks for a 24 page issue. And then when I get to the, the end, you know, this particular issue has a, like four extra pages. So it's a little bit longer. 
But this way, as I'm working, I can kind of like look at the whole series as it progresses. I can keep an eye out for things and mistakes that I didn't catch when I first drew it. But also having a wall full of comic pages that are in progress, it's sort of, it's like I can't stop. Having this work there to look at and see as I go, it, it motivates me. Having to come into my studio every day and see what's up there, I want to get another page on the board. So I can't remember if I've shown you that before. I may have posted pictures online, but I don't think I've ever specifically put that up for uh, for you guys on the, uh, the YouTube channel to, to see. So I just thought I would share that with you and give you guys a, a quick look. Let me see. Uh, all right. So let me see. Whoops. Well, it looks like we've been on for a, for a while now. Oh, you know what? Ion Rocks asked if we're going to talk about Lee and Kirby, which, you know, I'm sorry to see the passing of Stan Lee. You know, after, uh, you know, Jack Kirby was a huge part of that, of, you know, comics history. And I mean, together, Stan and Jack built Marvel Comics as we know it. Um, it's an end of an era. And never having met him at a convention, I'm certainly the least qualified person to eulogize him. All I can say is that, you know, I think for all of us that are comic fans, we definitely feel that that sadness that, you know, saying goodbye to someone that that gave us a big part of whatever whatever passion and love we have for comics and visual storytelling. Obviously, Jack was a huge part of that. Stan was a huge part of that. And, you know, may he rest in peace, both of them. Um Doing this whole chat in this weird way that I, I did it and not doing it from my phone and things being sort of herky-jerky, I can't tell how long we, we've been on, but given that we had the, the rough start in the beginning and now this, I think that this is probably a good point since I just finished that page to, to wrap it up for the day. Um, I see, uh, um, let's see here. Another Dan William said, uh, Ham is on his reading list. I'm glad. You're, you're very welcome. Um, let's see here. Kim Jong-Yi, this is from, from Ion Rock, said Kim Jong-Yi says to approximate the best of your ability, you don't need to be perfect. It's easy for him to say. <laughs> um, well, it's interesting as you can see the roughness in his work and that's the magic. He says stuff looks still looks awesome while rough. So I know I keep harping on it. Guys, I'm, I'm eventually gonna find that balance between making work that's energetic and not trying to make stuff perfect. It's something that's on my mind a lot because I'm wrestling with it, but I'm gonna get through it. I'm not gonna be as much of a perfectionist in the future. It's just me. It only comes up so much because I you're literally watching me evolve as an artist as I'm drawing. And so when you hit those points, when you feel a shift in your work coming, and you're like, how do I handle this? How do I approach this? Because I'm shift, I've been shifting hard towards improving, and I can see that I'm improving, but now I need to start shifting in terms of production and trying to get them to grow, you know, together hand in hand. And I'm just repeating what I've said over and over again in this video and in past videos. But I appreciate you guys staying with me over this process and uh, and and putting up with me repeating and returning to this subject. And Epic Trilogy says, your wall of progress is cool. Good idea for motivation. Uh, Christian Venston says, uh, damn, that's cool and a really good idea. I think I might try lining up my pages along the wall. Uh, UL says it's been an hour now. So that's good. Thanks so much. Oh, I got the idea from Carl Altstetter, putting up a page and putting your, wall, your um, artwork on the walls. And he worked with a bunch of the image guys in the past. So that's where he got it from. But he passed it on to me. I'm passing it on to you. Um, I've got a Patreon, patreon.com slash Jeremy. If you guys want to support the channel, please hop over there, toss me a couple bucks. Helps me put more time towards my creativity and hopefully someday I'll be able to do this full time. Thanks for joining me this weekend. Thanks for putting up with the rough, 
start and stop of the stream. And hopefully in the future, we'll work out the audio issues so that we can, uh, you know, I can have a couple other creators who I think might also add to this conversation sit in with us. So thanks so much. That's it for now. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe. There's links in the channel, in the channel description. Go be creative. <laughs>